there's nothing valuable in there. Well, good morning. Good morning. How many of you are now starting to become awake? All right, three of you. Great. Well, we're going to continue to talk about grace today, and we're going to talk about how grace is extreme. What do you think about when you hear the word extreme? Roller coasters? Skydiving, that's definitely extreme. Nancy Pocket. <laughs> Radical. All right, well, I, I decided to do a little searching for some extreme things. And so I have a few pictures for you this morning. I found some extreme things. Um, I, I would dare say that that's a little bit on the extreme side. You'll probably never see me doing anything like that. Um, I'd also consider that extreme. How many of you would like to try that? See, there's just something about extreme that draws us in, isn't there? Now, this next one, this next one, you know, there's a fine line between extreme and stupid. All right, a very fine line. And so I'm not sure if this is extreme. <laughs> or if it's stupid, or if it's photoshopped. I do not know. All right. This next guy resembles me quite a bit. At least muscle-wise. Um, well, not really. Um, but that's definitely pretty extreme. Also bordering on the stupid. Um, you don't want to see the next picture after that. <laughs> but that's definitely extreme. Now, there actually, I found an extreme, you know, because there's all kinds of extreme, there's extreme sports and extreme this and extreme that. But did you know that, well, this next one is, is definitely extreme. <laughs> That's extreme. This also is extreme. It's the last we ever saw that guy. Um, now, how many of you are really diligent about ironing your clothes? What? <laughs> Isaiah, we'll just assume that you're not. Um, but there actually is extreme ironing. Check this out. But if you don't think the bottom of the, the, the water is a good place to iron, then how about the top of a mountain? Sorry about, the, uh, he'll put his shirt on, don't worry. Um, and then there's this guy. <laughs> so, lots of extreme things going on. This morning, I want to, to think about the fact that God's grace is extreme. And so I want us to think about the extremeness. Is that a word? <coughs> yes? It's good. All right. But I want us to think about God's grace because God's grace is limitless. There is no end to the grace of God. God's grace is a grace that is limitless. And Jesus made that very clear when he came to earth, that his grace was without limits and it was for everyone. And that was not something that the Jewish people were expecting. They weren't expecting that God's grace was going to be for everyone. But no matter who you are, no matter where you're from, Jesus made a point to say, my grace is available for you. No matter what your past is, no matter what your problems, no matter what your issues are, no matter what it is, your financial status, your social standing, your ethnic background, there's no, nothing that limits you from experiencing the extreme grace of God. Jesus drove that point home. His grace was for foul-mouthed fishermen. His grace was for sexually immoral women. His grace was for cheaters, traitors, doubters, and self-promoters. His grace was for everyone. But God's grace was something that was apparent long before Jesus even came to earth. And so this morning I want us to take a trip back into the Old Testament. So if you have your Bible this morning, I want you to find the book of Ruth. We're going to spend a little time uh, in the book of Ruth. And as we find ourselves in the book of Ruth, we're going back to a time in Israel's history that was really not a good time. We're in the time that we would describe as the time of the judges. And so if you're familiar with, with that time, what had happened was the people of, of God were, were moving away from worshiping him. They were abandoning him. They were forsaking him. And so God would bring punishment. He would bring judgment upon his people, often through another people group that would attack them or through problems or d drought or disease. And so then the people would cry out to God and say, God, help us, rescue us. And so God would raise up a deliverer. We call them judges, but they were the people who spoke to the God and then God would speak to them and they would go to the people and say, this is what God wants you to do. And the people would repent and then God would bless them. And then after a while they would, what? They'd go back to doing what was right 
in their own eyes. There's a phrase in the book of Judges that we come to all the time. The people did what was right in their own eyes. And every time they did what was right in their own eyes, chaos resulted. And it isn't like that in our lives today. That when we do what's right in our own eyes instead of what's right in God's eyes, we bring chaos into our life. But in the middle of this time that was very dark and, and what would happen is every time they would come back they didn't come back quite as far and in fact as you progress through the book of Judges even the judges themselves become less and less godly but in the midst of that time God was still at work and his grace was still at work and we find an amazing story about God's grace in the book of Ruth so if you have your Bible let's just sort of highlight some things from the story of Ruth and I believe from it we're going to just see how extreme God's grace is. But just to set it up, just to summarize a little bit in chapter 1, what's happened is there is a man named uh, Elimelech and his wife is named Naomi and they live in Bethlehem. That place where Jesus will be born many years later but there's a famine in the land and the famine is probably a result of God's judgment right because the people have moved away from God so Elimelech decides that he's going to move his family to a place called Moab all right so this is way out to the east of where they live and they are going to move there to escape the famine the Moabites were a group of people that descended from Lot and they were not Israel's friends. They were Israel's enemies and they of course, you know, Lot, you, you remember the story there with his daughters, right? Uh, anybody remember that story? Alright, a few of you. Some of you really need to read the story. It's pretty interesting. But ultimately the people of, the, of Moab were descendants of a relationship between Lot and his daughter. Okay? And so as such, they were the enemies of Israel. In fact, in the Old Testament they were uh, excluded from being part of the worship of Israel. They could, a Moabite could not enter the temple to worship. It was not allowed. They could not even come into the court of the Gentiles. Moabites were excluded by the law. And so Elimelech moves his family to, to Moab. He has two sons and while he's there he dies. His two sons marry Moabite women. One was named Ruth and one was named Orpah. And while they're there, both of these sons die. And so Naomi is left in a foreign land with her daughter-in-laws and really no way of taking care of herself, no way of providing for herself. And so she is in a very, very difficult situation. And so she makes a decision to go back to her home because she hears that there's food and abundance there once again. So she makes plans to go back and she tells her daughter-in-laws, look, you need to stay here. There's nothing for you back there. I can't offer you anything back there. And so she tells them, please don't go with me. And after some tears and, and crying, there is a separation and Orpah goes back. But Ruth says, I want to go with you. And, and let's look at exactly why she says that. It says in verse 16 in chapter 1, Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge, and your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. And may the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go, she said no more. And so they go back and, and, and it's really just a pitiful situation. They have no way to provide for themselves. Women in this day, they couldn't necessarily get work. They couldn't own property. They really were not valued by society at all. And so they're in a very pitiful situation. So they come back to Bethlehem. It says in verse 19, it says, So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. Small town living. How many of you live in a small town? All right. How many of you know when something happens in a small town, it's big news, right? All right, so this is big news. Hey, did you hear? Hey, Naomi's back. And she's got this Moabite daughter-in-law that she's brought with her. And I, you know, I heard her husband died. And her son-in-law, God must be pretty mad at them. Right, you know how we do, right? We, we, in small towns, right, we find out the news. And then we, we, you know, and oh, by the way, we should pray for them, right? <laughs> you know, we, 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 uh, we, we judge them and run them through. And then we bless their heart. That's, that's the southern way of saying, wow, they are really messed up. In fact, it's so bad that uh, when they say, is this Naomi, look in verse 20, she said to them, do not call me Naomi, but call me Mara. She says, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara. Mara meant bitter. She says, I am a bitter woman. And she says, I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? 
when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me. So Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, and they returned from the country of Moab. One of the things that you notice in the book of Ruth is that Ruth comes back with Naomi, but she comes back with a label. And all throughout the book of Ruth, we're going to see that she is labeled as Ruth the Moabite. And this was not a positive label because the people in Bethlehem hated Moabites. They were not part of them. They were not of them. And they were excluded in their minds from knowing God and worshiping God. And so she has this label. And I think it's interesting because he says, this is Ruth the Moabite from Moab. Just to sort of emphasize it had a relative of her husband's, a worthy man of the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite, again there's that label, Ruth the Moabite, said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. And she said, go my daughter. So this was a, a provision that God had made for his people that if they didn't have work or could not work or could not support themselves, they could go to the fields where the harvesters were harvesting and the, they were to leave some of the grain that fell behind. They were to leave the corners of the field unharvested so that people who did not have anything could come and work and find enough to eat. And so Ruth says, let me go out, Naomi, and provide for us. Even though it was risky, she was risking her life, she was risking being uh, attacked, she was risking a lot of things because women didn't have a lot of protection and certainly a foreign woman had little to none. And look at what it says, so she went out and gleaned in the field of the reapers, chapter 2 verse 3, and she happened, she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz. I, I, I believe it, it says that to get our attention. It didn't just happen. This was God's providence. This was God's leading of Ruth. And she came to the field belonging to Boaz, who was the clan of Elimelech. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem, and he said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to, the young, to his young man, who was in charge of the reapers, Who... Whose young woman is this? So he right away, he notices Ruth. And of course he notices Ruth, right? Because the town has been talking about Naomi and Ruth. Right? The, the word is on the street, but he also notices her because she's different. She looks different. She's foreign. And so he notices her. He said, whose young woman is this? And the servant who is in charge of the reapers answered and said, she is the young Moabite woman. She's the Moabite woman, Boaz. And she came back with Naomi from Moab. <laughs> Isn't that great? She's the Moabite woman from Moab. Like, it's just, can you just kind of sense he's wanting to emphasize something? It's like saying you're the New Jerseyan from New Jersey. Like, you get it the first time. She said, please let me come and glean and gather among the sheaves after the reapers. So she came, and she has continued from early morning until now, except for a short rest. Then Boaz said to Ruth, now listen, my daughter. Wow, that's, that's unexpected. He calls her his daughter. Do not go and to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? He says, I have already ordered the men that are around you, not to abuse you or to hurt you or to harm you or take advantage of you. He says, and when you're thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face and bowing to the ground said to him, why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? That was her label. But Boaz answered her, all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told to me. How you left your father and mother and native land and came to a people that you did not know. May the Lord repay you for what you've done and a full reward be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. And then she said, I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoke kindly to your servant, even though I am not one of your servants. And so the chapter goes on, and at mealtime, Boaz made sure that she got enough to eat for lunch, and then he made sure that his workers left extra grain for Ruth. He made sure that she went home with way more than a reaper would normally go home with. And when she goes home that night and she shows her mother-in-law, she says, here's what I got today. Her mother-in-law immediately looks and says, what happened? Because you could not have gleaned that much in one day. 
and she describes that she went to the field of Boaz. And the Bible says that she continued to go back and glean from the fields of Boaz. Well, eventually Naomi realizes, you know, wait a minute, Boaz is our relative, and Boaz could do something for us. Boaz could redeem us. God had made a provision that women and families were to be protected and so a near relative would marry someone to carry on the inheritance and legacy of that family. And she said Boaz is a close relative. Boaz could be our redeemer. And so with all the town talking and in the midst of this bitter situation we can see God's hand at work in their lives. And so Naomi comes up with a plan what, look in chapter 3 with me. She says, Is not Boaz our relative, with whose young women you were? See, he, was winnowing, see, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Wash, therefore, and anoint yourself, and put on your cloak, and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down and observes the place where he lies, then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. Now, I want you to know that this is not a modern-day dating strategy. Are you with me? All right. So, ladies, this is not generally how you would approach a guy. But this actually was a very common custom. It was a very symbolic thing that she was asking him of, which was to redeem her and to marry her and to provide for her. And so they go on with a plan. And it says, it happens just like Boaz had eaten and he had drunk and his heart was merry and he went to lie down. And it says, then she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight, the man was startled and he turned over and behold, a woman was at his feet. And he said, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant for you are a redeemer. And he said, May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter, for you've made this last kindness greater than your first, in that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear, for I will do for you what you ask, for my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. And now it is true that I am a redeemer. And then he goes on and says, But there's someone that's closer than I. There's actually someone who has the right to do this other than me. So I'll ask him in the morning. And if he wants to do it, then he'll redeem you. But if not, I will. And so the next day, they're at the town gate. And they're having this meeting. And Boaz says, Hey, I, I've got a question for you. Did you know that you were a close relative to Naomi and to Ruth? And would you like to redeem their land? And the guy's like, yes, I would like to redeem their land. And Boaz says, and by the way, if you redeem their land, then you have to take Ruth as your wife. And the guy was like, no, I don't want to do that. And so Boaz says, I'll do it. And the way that they sealed the deal was they traded shoes. All right? Pretty interesting. You know, we signed contracts on these things. They traded sandals. And so Boaz makes the arrangements. And then he marries Ruth. He redeems Ruth. I want you to see this morning the grace that happened in Ruth's life. I want you to see a God who gives grace. Because really in such a way she also represents us. Because just as Ruth, who was an outcast, who had no right or stake to claim in the kingdom of God. She was a Moabite. The Moabites were outcasts. They had no right. They had no stake, no claim in God's kingdom. In fact, by law in Deuteronomy, they were excluded. And yet God in his graciousness and his kindness leads Ruth to know him and believe in him. Remember back in chapter 1, she said, your God, Naomi, is my God. She came to place her faith and her trust in the God of Israel. And God provided her a redeemer in Boaz to take care of her and to provide for her. But he was also writing her into his story and he was giving her a new label throughout the book. She's called Ruth the Moabitess. But look at chapter 4 verse 13 when they get to the wedding. It says, so Boaz took Ruth. No more label about being a Moabite. You see, God's grace changes our label. It changes our identity. God provided a redeemer for Ruth. But I want you to know that he provided a redeemer for you. Because Jesus is your redeemer. Because hundreds of years later, in that same town, right, there was a cry of a baby one night. And that baby was Jesus, born in Bethlehem. Born in a stable. A baby like never before. 
Jesus had come into the world as God. He came to bring grace. And not just for the Jews, but for everyone. His family tree included a lot of people that no one would ever expect it to include. People like Rahab and people like Ruth got written into God's story. And see, we really need to see ourselves, yesterday we talked about seeing ourselves as Barabbas, as being condemned and guilty, but we also need to see ourselves as Ruth. We are outsiders and outcasts apart from God. And we are in need of redemption. And Jesus did that. Look at what Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 says. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. See, the law leaves us guilty. The law leaves us guilty before a holy God. It says, but Christ redeemed us. He bought us. He purchased us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. And so Jesus absorbs the wrath of God, the curse of God that's on our life. Jesus is your Redeemer. God's grace intersected Ruth's life. She was no longer Ruth the Moabite. She was Ruth the wife of Boaz. God's grace changes your label. You're not who you used to be. You see, we all have labels that we wear. Sometimes we give ourselves our own labels. We label ourselves the way we want people to see us or look at us. Sometimes labels get put on us. How many of you have ever had a label put on you? All right. Maybe it was by kids in school. Maybe it was by your parents. Maybe it was by a teacher. I got all kinds of labels put on me when I was growing up. All right. Believe it or not, I was not one of the cool kids growing up. How many of you can believe that? Thank you for being kind. <laughs> I know most of you can believe it. In fact, I used to, in elementary school, I got called Donald Duck Double Dork. <laughs> That's painful. My therapist and I are still working in that out. <laughs> but you see, God's grace, it gives us a new label, a new story. You know, I think about that and how God offers us this new story and this new grace. Um, I often thought about why was it? What was it about Boaz that caused him to be so interested in Ruth? What was it about Boaz? I mean, we hear that he was a worthy man and his character and how he did things reflects the fact that Boaz was a man who loved God and walked with God. He had integrity in all that he did. It's very evident in his willingness to protect Ruth and to take care of her and how he took care of his men and made sure that they didn't do things they weren't supposed to be doing. Even in how he made sure that the person who had the right to redeem her had his chance. He did everything with integrity. He was a worthy man. But what made him take notice of Ruth? Well, there's an interesting little part of his family history that you need to understand because I really believe it's the key to why he noticed Ruth and why he was so motivated to show grace to this foreigner. It was because grace was part of his family story. Because Boaz's mother was a woman named Rahab. Rahab was also a foreigner, a non-Jew. And not only was she a foreigner and a non-Jew, but she was a prostitute. But she came to hear and know about the God of creation. The God who made this world and created this world. The God of Israel. And she put her faith in him. And when the spies came to Jericho, she hid them. By faith, the Bible says. Because of her belief in God. And God protected her and he rescued her and her family when God destroyed Jericho. And then, we don't know how it all unfolded, but one day a guy named Salmon. Now, when you grow up and have kids, do not name your kids Salmon. <laughs> Alright? That's just not cool. But back then, maybe it was okay. But this guy named Salmon, for whatever reason, he looked at Rahab and he saw her not for who she was. He saw her not for who her past was, but he saw her as a daughter of God. And he married her. And they had this son named Boaz. Boaz grew up understanding what God's grace looked like. And I believe it's what motivated him to show grace to, Rahab, uh, to Ruth. God wants you and I to realize that, that he wants to write us into his story. Isn't it amazing how God took these foreign women and gave them new labels and new stories? Their old labels were prostitute and foreigner. But now they have a new label and a new story. And God wrote them in. Read Matthew chapter 1 today. Sometime. Not right now. But read Matthew chapter 1. 
because it's the genealogy that Matthew shares of Jesus and in that genealogy he includes Rahab and Ruth. Isn't that amazing? Two foreign women, not part of what you would normally think is a family tree. You're like, I'm going to leave that part of the family history out. God wrote them into his story and God wants to write you into his story. That's what God's extreme grace is all about. He is writing you into his story. And he wants to give you a new label. Whatever labels you've carried, whether it's a good label or a bad label, God wants your label to be grace. That grace has happened to you. And that his righteousness has been applied to you. And he wants you to take refuge in his grace. And then live out that story of grace. To live out what God's grace has done for you. Because here's the thing. No matter what you've done and no matter where you've been, no matter what your past looks like, God's grace writes new stories. Aren't you thankful for that? God's not finished with you. When you mess up, when you make mistakes, God's not done with you because His grace is greater than your sin and His grace can give you a new story. And God wants you to be part of this story that He's writing. God's story is yet still being written. And you and I, by grace, get to be part of that story. He calls us to live in His kingdom, to live as citizens of heaven. And to live out our story of grace. His grace is extreme. His grace gives us a new label. And God sees you, not for who you were, but for who you are. And so I want to challenge you this morning to live out your story of grace. To remember Ruth. And to remember that God is a God who reaches out into our mess, into our brokenness into our pitiful situations and he offers grace and he offers redemption and just as Boaz redeemed Ruth Jesus Christ has redeemed you he paid the price for you think about that in order for you to have a relationship with God a price had to be paid there was a cost and Jesus paid that price with his life with his blood he has redeemed you he has bought you and he wants that label to be the thing that defines you. Not your labels that are put on you by your friends or your parents. Not your talents. Not your degrees. Not anything other than his grace. And then he wants you to live out that story. Would you bow your heads this morning? Just for a moment. I just want you to think about how extreme God's grace has been towards us. Because we are outcasts. We have no right or stake or claim in the kingdom of God. We were sinners. We were dead. We were doomed. And we deserve the judgment that was coming. But God redeemed us. And he sent us a redeemer. And I just want you to picture Jesus as your redeemer this morning. The one who's rescued you and gathered you to himself. And he wants to give you that new label. That new story of, of what his grace can do. And he wants you to live out that story. He doesn't want you to, to live out your old story anymore. He wants you to live that new story of grace. Would you commit to that today? Let me pray for you. Father, I just pray that that we would understand how incredible your grace is today. And Father, I pray that we'd understand how extreme and how far your grace goes to reach into our lives and to change us, to give us a new label and a new story. And Father, I pray that everyone here today would understand that you are their Redeemer, that you've bought them, and that they belong to you. And they would let that label define who they are and how they live. And that you would empower them by your grace to live the story that you're calling them to live. A story of your grace and what only your grace can do. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.